Hello and welcome to Armenian News Network Grung Weekend Review for Sunday, November 8, 2020. In this episode, we continue to discuss various topics around the war in Artsakh. Our guests for this episode were Emil Sanamian, a senior research fellow at USC's Institute of Armenian Studies specializing in the politics in the Caucasus with a special focus on Azerbaijan, Yerea Tashjan, a regional analyst and researcher based in Beirut with expertise in China, Iran, and the Persian Gulf. Tashjan is the regional officer of Women in War, a gender-based think tank, and a host of a weekly radio program called Turkey Today. And Aspet Kochikian, a senior lecturer of political science and international relations at Bentley University in Massachusetts, where he teaches courses on the Middle East and the former Soviet space. Now, just a heads up that this uh, episode was recorded on Saturday, November 7th, one day before Nikol Pashinyan, along with Ilham Aliyev and Vladimir Putin, signed the ceasefire treaty. Hello and welcome everyone. Hello. 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 Hi. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. We have six weeks of war now and notwithstanding even the territorial issues, the constant fighting, the cities of Shushi and Stepanakert are being shelled almost constantly. Or as just a world citizen, it's, it's painful to me to listen to the silence of the world that's going on right now. I think we need to turn you know, this question to ourselves and to the leadership of Armenia and Artsakh. Given what we have right now, what do we do? What do we expect of our leaders? I just wanted to hear your thoughts about it. I was just looking at the Prime Minister's website. It seems like over the past month, his main preoccupation has been giving interviews. It seems probably... Uh one thing to do but i wouldn't make it the only thing to do considering the grave nature of the current situation it seems to me that uh, messaging from prime minister's office and generally prime minister have not been great he seems to be you know out of his depth in terms of the foreign relations aspect of it and the logistics of the war the main uh, issue, uh, the reason we're still getting so much shelling going on is because Azerbaijan was able to uh, restock on ammunition from Israel, from Ukraine, probably from Belarus as well. Uh, there are no reports that Kazakhstan is supplying also. It just shows the, the, the continued failure of uh, Armenian foreign policy. In terms of the only relative ally on this issue, Russia, again, it's been over a month of this fighting. There has not been a meeting between uh, Nikol Pashinyan and Putin. And in the last uh, number of days, I don't think they even talked on the phone. So we see this colossal failure by Nikol Pashinyan as a leader of Armenia. He's not passing this test. The burden is not just on the political leadership of just the government. I think overall the political climate and the political mentality that exists in general. And I think to a large extent it is a, this, it's a divide that exists between what we know, what we know for sure what's happening on the ground and what is happening actually on the ground. And I think that doesn't diminish the fact that Armenian diplomacy was caught off guard. Armenian diplomacy diplomacy in the last at least decade, a decade and a half has been a reactive rather than proactive mode. And the fact that, you know, the attack was a plan way in advance by Azerbaijan and Turkey, they actually also prepared the groundwork for a diplomatic, a, a diplomatic offensive as well something that Armenia in peacetime was not able to handle, let alone during a wartime. One of the other things I have to say is that unlike the initial weeks, uh, of the initial couple of weeks of the war, it seems that when it comes to uh, communicating with the public, be that the journalists or the Armenian citizens or the world in general, in terms of updates, you know, there are two sources that are coming out. And I think that might be a good strategy as well. Again, without knowing and without understanding what's going on behind the scenes, but the spokespeople in both Artsakh and in Armenia seem to be the one ones who actually everyone gazing their eyes on uh, to get information and to get to transmit that data and information about the overall uh, pro uh, progress. I realize your arguments and but I'd like to say okay given all the preparations that the Azeris uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey have had I and mean, we cannot change the past but you know if we are here today as a leader what would you recommend to Pashinyan that he isn't doing specifically something tangible that Armenia could do the top three things that would alleviate the suffering at least uh, from Stepanakert and Shushi I mean I think it's beyond any kind of imagination that you know we're allowing for 45 days or nearly 45 days we're allowing the citizens of Armenia and Artsakh to be shelled even in Armenia we have had some deaths in Abitbek itself so where is the red line for Armenia and, and what are going to be our responses? Well, the red lines have been crossed for a long time. The red line is way past. The question on two, uh, two fronts. One is diplomatic, the other military. I think at this point, Armenian side cannot do anything to stop the shelling. 
I mean, yes, they might stop some of the drones and so on and so forth, but the mil militarily, Armenia is doing whatever it can to the maximum and beyond. But diplomatically, to rally support and so on, the last couple of weeks, except for towns and cities, councilmen or, and, and the city councils and so on, recognizing Artsakh's independence, there hasn't been any interest in supporting Armenia diplomatically on this issue. This is why uh, it, when it comes to uh, evaluation, that's where we, we fall short. Uh, in terms of military, I mean, certainly Armenian army is there fighting uh, in defense of Karabakh. However, the way this war has progressed, it has progressed on Azerbaijan's terms, meaning the war initially was focused on the south of Karabakh, and now it's focused on, again, on the southern half of Karabakh. The terms uh, of uh, non-fighting on the rest of the Armenian-Azerbaijani border are also advantageous to Azerbaijan because they're most exposed and in the northwest, some areas of Nakhchivan and elsewhere. So Armenian government has allowed uh, for the scenario to unravel without uh, confronting Azerbaijan on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border, both to alleviate the fighting in Karabakh and also to uh, draw in Russia, basically. That's uh, the main instrument uh, that Armenia could bring to bear uh, into this conflict to restore the balance of forces that uh, Turkish involvement had so violated. And by not uh, confronting Azerbaijan on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border, Armenian government basically signs off on uh, defeat in Karabakh and in the future possibly defeat in other areas. That is a colossal failure, I think, of military thinking and uh, diplomatic thinking, inability to shift gears in a way that would change the course of this war. Do you think the decision not to engage Azerbaijan on the recognized borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan itself has anything to do with Russia. We saw a week ago, or like uh, less than a week ago, some would say, uh, you know, it was far too late, but Pashinyan sent a letter to Putin asking for preparedness and giving military aid, but asking for consultations. Consultations, exactly. Armenia itself has been attacked several times. So a lot of people are asking, why doesn't this defense agreement or defense pact between Russia and Armenia kick in? Is, uh, is Armenia being passive or is it just Russia saying, you know, it's not time yet? Look, Armenia is the Republic of Armenia's territory had been attacked over many, many years. Uh, part of it was seized in 1992 in August, uh, you know, the Artsvashen enclave, that those things don't trigger automatic responses by treaty allies, uh, nowhere in the world, and especially in this part of the world. So this shelling that occurred, you know, it wasn't on a scale that probably similar to the shelling that occurred, say, in 2015. So they're just that those shelling episodes, they would certainly not trigger any reaction. Uh, Large-scale fighting would trigger a reaction, would have to trigger a reaction. There is probably pressure from Russia not to do that, for, for Armenia not to do that, so that it doesn't have to get drawn in. But, you know, if there is <laughs> some element of uh, independent decision-making there, you know, it has to be implemented, it has to be seen that there is independent decision-making. Right now, Armenia, Armenia's leadership hemmed in themselves and hemmed in Karabakh into a situation that's not winnable. Uh, yeah, yeah. do you have anything to add? There were already talks in Armenia, especially by the opposition, about the establishment of a war council. I support this idea because the problem is that the current leadership in Armenia, I mean, I, I don't want to criticize because it's a war, but sometimes we have to. They don't have the political and the military maturity, right? Let's be specific about that. For example, I just heard yesterday that Alan Simonian is going to Moscow for consultation. For God's sake, wasn't there anyone else better than Alan Simonian? If you just read his tweets and the posts, Facebook posts in 2015, he was very, very critical to President Putin. So you cannot send such provocative people to Moscow and think that the Russians will accept such things. So there is also some reservation from Russia towards the current army leadership, but the Russians are helping. The fact is that we are continuing this war is thanks to the Russian arms. Let's be realistic about that. Also, another thing that was very, very wrong, what I read, it was, I think, 10 days ago or something, when the American official who said that maybe we can deploy Scandinavian people peacekeeping forces in Artsakh or nagorno karabakh Some MPs very close to Pashinyan's team, they were like very happy saying that yes, the Scandinavian forces are very welcome. I mean, without noticing that actually Denmark and Norway are part of NATO. So you're inviting NATO forces, you're being happy to invite NATO forces in nagorno karabakh at the same time expecting or saying, asking why Russia is not helping us. So there are some problems within the army and leadership. That is why I prefer to establish a war council, this will not sideline Pashinyan, definitely, no, that's not the plan. But however, we need experienced army official, ministry of defenses, diplomats, especially our diplomats. They are experts in posting on social media, but however, I do not see them lobbying on the ground. I mean, I see, for example, the diaspora committees, the high tide committees, they are active, but however, still I have reservation on the, our diplomatic circles. I can't help but recall our conversation, I think, two weeks ago, when, on the same topic 
topic. And there was concern raised that this war council might be seen as a way to take political power from Pashinyan. But, you know, I wonder if there's any change in our thinking from the others uh, related to this. Some change in Armenia is needed. Uh, Hovik, we have a precedent uh, of 1992 when similarly Artsakh came to a verge of defeat, a uh, complete collapse uh, in August 1992. At the time, uh, the formal leadership in Karabakh was the Supreme Council, so it was a parliamentary system. The parliamentary leadership resigned at the time. At the time, was still acting uh, Georgi Petrasyan. He, uh, uh, sorry, he did not resign. He handed uh, he, the parliament voted in uh, the State Defense Committee led by Robert Kocherian. What formula would be followed in this case? I don't understand a war council comprised of, I don't know, some experienced people or whatnot. Obviously, it has to be different leadership right now. Uh, basically, uh, it boils down to Robert Kocherian again because there's not another person in Armenia that, in addition to experience, actually has current political capital with Russia. There is not another person. And as much as he's a problematic figure, as much as he is a controversial figure, there is not another person can they can deliver Russian support in the way he does. If that's a chance and Nikol Pashinyan would not want to take it because that's personally unacceptable to him, then that means his personal biases and interests trump national interest. And that's a very bad way to go. Also about this uh, creating the council and so on. When we're talking about the precedents, as Emil mentioned, we're also talking about a period where you didn't have strong institutions that could actually allow the absorption of different ideas. And now putting aside whether the current Armenian leadership is willing to absorb or is willing to listen to others, uh, the, the suggestion to create a parallel structure is in itself uh, the problematic aspect of that proposal. In terms of, okay, so we should have a council, we should have basically take away the decision making from... But that's exactly what we did during the coronavirus pandemic. He created the office of the commandant and the commandant was controlling everything on the ground. So why isn't that president valid here? Right, but using within the state institution. Again, the question becomes if he creates a body within the state institutions by a decree that it's going to be a system or a body or a consultative body, then it might make sense to include them in consultation. The commandant that was created was the deputy prime minister, so it was still within the institution. I don't want to go into high academic discussions about these, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have also institutions that can allow or do allow the integration of various opinions and so on. That doesn't mean that what Emil mentioned is not true. There is obviously personal issues, personal scores to settle, and personal sensitivities. But what the other 16 parties were calling for, they were calling for the creation of a completely new body outside of a structure. No, I, I'm sorry. I don't understand that approach. I understand the approach that there is a legitimate parliament in Armenia that had elected a prime minister. Prime minister is incapable of uh, d defending Armenia for whatever reason, uh, combinational reasons. Prime minister's choice right now is to resign and nominate somebody else for his party to endorse. Uh, that's the direct route to changing the course of policy, not set up of some parallel structures. There has to be a vote by parliament where he, they elect a new prime minister. Parliament will remain majority controlled by Pashinyan's people. I don't think we're going to have elections anytime soon. But uh, they will take a decision, considering everything that's happening, that there has to be different leader. I don't know, it could be not Kocherian, somebody else might be a more compromised figure between Kocherian and somebody who has some kind of uh, weight internationally to be able to right this uh, balance of forces that has been uh, destroyed by uh, Turkish involvement. I mean, from day one, it was clear that because Turkey is directly involved, Armenia would not be able to fight Turkey. I mean, this has been you know, the rationale for the alliance with Russia from the beginning. And the fact that they're fighting on the territory of Artsakh rather than Armenia makes very little difference from the perspective of Armenia's future. So that inability to understand this is causing this death and destruction. And going back to what Hobik said, I mean, I think one of the things about what advice can be, I think what you just mentioned would be the best uh, sort of approach. However, as we know, personalities and egos are more important or take precedence, whoever that might be. It's just not with, uh, with Pashinyan, but also with others because everyone thinks that they can do better without actually understanding the reality on the ground. They might be a tad better, but not necessarily completely overturn the, the the tide, the military tide. No, yeah, I mean, there's no guarantee. It's just you, you just improve your chances. That's all it's about. The fact that Turkey has been involved from day one, Armenia could have been similarly and covertly involved on the side of Arapa. I don't see why the Armenian army has not engaged. I mean, there's logistical support and everything, but... No, no, Armenian army is engaged directly in Karabakh. I'm saying by, you know, geography is very important. There's only two roads that you can resupply Karabakh with. They've uh, focused on Karabakh for many years 
leaders they know the the they they have a huge advantage in terms of logistical approach and in terms of concentrating forces and achieving uh, tactical objectives there uh, you have to overturn that table the way things were overturned back in uh, 1992 after uh, six months of fighting that armenians were losing in mardakert and they kept fighting in mardakert they realized that they have to refocus the attention of their attack into areas where the other side is exposed not where we are exposed and that's what overturned the military situation at the time unfortunately you know i don't see that happening in the last 40 days the initiative is still azerbaijan side the turkish side they focus on where they want to focus and that's where our side concentrates forces and our side gets exposed and our side gets defeated so that's the overall picture i'm not saying that by just focusing on somewhere else there's going to be immediate success i'm just saying that is how you do it you hit where your opponent is exposed not where you're exposed well i mean what you're saying is basically reactive versus proactive right so far uh, so far our position has been reactive in the sense that okay they're advancing in the south where we're going to throw everything we have in the south rather than you know look at where in the north for instance where there had uh, relatively the Azerbaijani side had relatively little success that could have been also a way that you could just divert the attention and if you're losing territory in the south then you might gain some in the north and that could alleviate the pressure from the south this is the tactical decision where at least none of us here are military experts but it's the logical thing that you would see but i think it's about being overwhelmed on the armenian side uh, like the azerbaijani side now you know their the supply lines are stretched thin in terms of getting the recruits in terms of aerial domination by the azerbaijanis and so on not anymore not as much as it was before but uh, it's a congruence of so many aspects that actually is not allowing the Armenian side to think more strategically. And I don't think that at this point, you know, it's the government, it's not about finding fault. It's just a matter of getting some perspective that even the military is not able to because they're so engaged in stopping the Azeri advance, Azerbaijani advancement. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Okay, so going to back to Russia, I realize they don't want to get engaged to protect Armenia and they're dragging their feet, maybe. But on the issue of terrorists, we've seen what Armenia calls terrorists and what Russia calls terrorists and what Iran calls terrorists, but what the Western world calls mercenaries. During the past week, Russia has continued to stress this issue and uh, it expresses discomfort with the presence of terrorists in Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh at multiple layers. Putin has said it, Foreign Minister Larov has said it, the spokesperson Maria Zakharova has said it. Many governments worldwide, US, France, Iran, have confirmed this news. Aliyev continues to deny it. He says, to quote, I regret that high-ranking officials of the countries that should be neutral and act on the basis of mandate given to them by the OSC use these unconfirmed information and rumors. And I think that it was in response to Aliyev's denial that Russia upped the ante and the director of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, Sergei Narishkin, reaffirmed that they have very high confidence in their intelligence. And in addition to this, Narishkin also claimed that Turkish intelligence and special ops units are active in Artsakh. To all of us, that would be very basic information. We've seen it for more than 40 days now. What do you think, Emil, about what Russia is doing here? Are they preparing the ground for some, taking some action in whatever way they can in Artsakh? Or what is their strategy? I don't think they have finalized their strategy. It seems like, again, their decision-making process is very, very, not just opaque, but uh, very centralized. So uh, a lot of those things depend on personal uh, moods and uh, personal inclinations of Vladimir Putin. He is looking for excuses not to get heavily involved. I mean, obviously, the Armenia is fighting him those excuses, both by, you know, keeping Pashinyan as a, for Putin, controversial leader, as not engaging on the Armenian Azerbaijani border. They're providing excuses for him not to get engaged uh, more heavily. We can think of this as a situation where uh, it is up to Armenia to basically to move that line further away uh, and protect as many Armenians as possible and make that a line for Russia as well, rather than just for Armenia. They may have uh, drawn the line saying that like, our line is don't cross into Republic of Armenia territory. Okay, where is that line? I mean, where is that physical line? Do we are we able to draw at least extend it to cover Stepanakert and Shushi and, uh, and the road between them? That's not clear right now. That's not been uh, articulated by Armenia and not been articulated by Russia. I mean, the only person I actually heard it articulated by is Macron. He said that we won't let them to Stephen Akert or something like that. Early In the early days, he said that. But I mean, they haven't done anything about it and they're not capable of doing anything about it, I don't think. Russia is capable about uh, capable of doing something about yeah. that. Speaking of uh, speaking Macron, uh, earlier today, they also met uh, Lavrov and uh, his French colleague. It was about terrorism in general. And they said they will fight against terrorism in all its forms. 
And they also mentioned Artsakh, their concern. I hate this word concern now, uh, but, you know, concern about Syrian and Libyan extremists fighting in Artsakh. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, we have to look at this situation from a purely pragmatic perspective. What they have achieved by bringing those guys in is they have a couple thousand cannon fodder that they can use and achieve objectives. We have to look at it from that perspective, not from the perspective just of, oh, they're, you know, it's been 25 years and they still rely on mercenaries. Yeah, they rely on mercenaries. And why shouldn't we rely on mercenaries if we don't have enough resources? I mean, where are our mercenaries? I mean, there, there's got to be some people who are friendly to Armenia and Russia or, I don't know, around the Middle East. Where are those guys? Why are they not in Armenia? And they're not in Armenia because... It's another failure of Armenian uh, foreign policy and logistical preparation. I recall there was a statement by the leader of the Donbass mercenaries that they are on standby to go to Artsakh if needed. But right now they mentioned Pashinyan again <laughs> and his uh, unfriendly attitude towards Russia. And they, they want to hear a call from someone in Russia saying that, you know, they're, they should do that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, they keep saying that, well, first of all, we haven't heard uh, any uh, requests for assistance from Armenia on Artsakh. Uh, they will find excuses and, uh, you know, Armenian leadership has supplied them those excuses. There are a couple of things I want to add here. First of all, about the red lines, I think there are different red lines for different people. One of the other things, however, we also have to realize that using, uh, invoking Pashinyan as someone who's not responding is also partially an excuse. It's not necessarily the whole question. It's the whole issue that has to go out there as well. Now, the other thing is about the red lines when it comes to the red lines there are so many different red lines but let's look at what are the red lines that at least some of the countries agree on i think when it comes to specifically this issue about the mercenaries and uh, the jihadists or the uh, the mercenaries however you want to call them there is a clear sign at least from russia and iran that they are mostly concerned about that and this stems from the fact that in the case of russia they had their own jihadist issues I remember when I was conducting research in Iraq and Syria, one of the things that people were uh, expressing is that there are a lot of people coming in from North Caucasus and the Russia was allowing that because it was actually exporting it, not for the sake of implementing or enforcing policies, rather, you know, better there than here kind of a policy. So now that they're back... Aspet, I actually want to challenge that. Do you really think that Russia cares more about 2,000 terrorists? Let's call them like this. Let's use the most worst possible definition of that. Let's say beheading terrorists. You know, do you think Russia cares more about that than actually creating another hotbed of instability for the next hundred years? Can I interrupt again? I'm sorry. Uh, can I interrupt again? It's it's not terrorists. It's extension of Turkish policy. Those are Turkish forces. They're just, you know, not comprised of Turkish citizens yet. I mean, there are many of them there on the hopes that they're going to become Turkish citizens, you know. So uh, this is an extension of Turkish irregular force in addition to regular air force that is there well that was one of the ways that turkey coerced them right i mean my question was exactly that i think that they're using the term terrorists publicly for political purposes almost but do they really care more about that i want to believe that russia actually does care i would challenge your challenge Holik. i think i think you know if you were to think about it you know they're about to get citizenships yes uh, they have to but these are all elements of various groups fighting in northern Syria that were recruited and they were problem other than financial promise they were also promised her citizenship which at this point is a, a very hot commodity any any citizenship other than Syrian is a hot commodity for these people but put aside these are radicalized radical uh, people with radical ideas whatever they we want to call them the people with radical ideas out of those 2000 if you end up having 100 crossing into Russia, into northern northern Caucasus, that's enough to radicalize. We see this happening. This is what happened in, in Iraq. This is what happened in Syria. This is what happened in other hotbeds, in Nigeria. These guys don't know Russian, you know, they, they would be, but they would be very easy to detect and, uh, you know, extinguish in Russia. I mean, th that's the problem. I mean, these are not like Chechnyan terrorists who know Russian, who can function and live in, uh, you know, sleeper cells in Russia for 15 years. Who said that they were going to be open in the open? We're not talking about uh, in an open society. Society. We're not talking about them walking around in the streets of Grozny and so on. I mean, this is basically, it's about the underground efforts, and they've done this before. Do you think that most of the terrorists who were fighting in, in Syria uh, were, were speaking Arabic? They're not. That's that's irrelevant, I think. That's a that's an irrelevant point. From a Russian perspective, they've witnessed this several times, and they managed to diffuse that tension in Russia. And that is one of the concerns that they have. By the same token, the Iranians have the same thing. After years of fighting on their borders in Afghanistan and their involvement in Iraq with the same thing, they do not want to see that happening. They want to keep the balance of power as is in the region. And there are two concerns. I think there's a difference saying balance of power in the region versus 
the concern about these small cells of terrorists trying to blow up things, you know, metros and buildings in Russia. Maybe not immediately, but eventually it's going to go there. And again, Hovig, it's not about to what extent these groups, these people can infiltrate. They don't speak Azeri, they don't speak Turkish, and they're still there and they're part of it. But it's not about them actually taking things. It's just a matter of radicalization. This we've seen around a lot. Uh, for instance, in 1980, 1970, 1970, 71, 72, when the PLO was relocated from Jordan to uh, to Lebanon, they managed to, yes, they speak the language. You might say that they spoke the language, the same language, but they managed just their presence there, radicalized other groups, other domestic Lebanese groups. So when you have 100, 100 200 Syrian radical fundamentalists in, in places where there's already an inclination to become uh, radicalized, this is something that Russia has many, many concerns. There's probably concern over that, but I think it's a greater concern over the fact that Turkey is now the chief decision maker in the South Caucasus. That's much more of a serious concern for Russia than any kind of subterranean uh, guerrilla type of activity. When you have another power, in this case Turkey led by Erdogan, dictating the terms of uh, you know that region, that just that just throws throws Russia off in a, such a big way. This is Commonwealth of Independent States. This is uh, you know former Soviet Union. Uh, this is very close to the Russian border, and now there is another power in that region that is dictating the terms. That's the challenge to Putin that he's grappling with or whatever he's doing, but uh, that is the challenge. It's not just about the small groups that might infiltrate and, uh, you know, do some nefarious things if they succeed. If that was just, that was the only challenge, that, you know, that's that's a minor issue. In this case, they have a major power undermining Russia's uh, position in that, in that part of the world. But Emil, if for Putin, the, the balance is between uh, let's say his disapproval of Armenian le leadership versus letting Turkey into the Caucasus. How is he making this choice? Well, he's, we see how he's making his choice. He's uh, on the one hand declaring his neutrality in this war and basically suggesting that uh, Azerbaijan is justified to take whatever territory they want uh, because it was part of the so Soviet Azerbaijan or was outside of NKO territory, whatever. I mean, he's finding excuses after excuses not to get involved and hoping that he can through his uh, diplomacy with Erdogan to kind of stop it. But, you know, he hasn't been successful in that. So I think D-Day is coming for Putin to decision day. And uh, our uh, Armenian side's job is to make that decision day come faster rather than further into the future. I mean, it was this, this 40 days have been wasted in that sense, you know. But this raises another issue, Emil. I think with so limited information and head-scratching moments about why isn't Russia doing what it is, isn't it possible to also argue that, you know, this is actually what Putin is planning as well. I mean, this is part of Putin's plan to let things go, to let Turkey do its job. They're the ones who are... Uh, who were tainted, quote unquote, by being uh, pro Azerbaijani and so on and so forth. And he's basically able to uh, pick up the fruits of the labor one way or another. Again, not a lot of information available, but maybe this is part of uh, Russia's approach on, on the issue in terms of, okay, once and for all, let's get rid of this issue. Okay, let, let Azerbaijan get it. Let Azerbaijan do what it can. Uh, I'm not going to help them, I mean, but I'm not going to stop them. That way, actually, Azerbaijan can also be, to a large extent, I think, thankful to Russia for not intervening. And the fact that the, the collective security agreement is only when a country is attacked, not when you're an attacker. The same thing with NATO, by the way. Just because you're a me member of NATO and you attack another country doesn't mean NATO is going to come to your support. And that's why you have this wait and see in Armenia as to, okay, the Russians are going to intervene only if Armenia is uh, is attacked directly, large-scale attack, not a shelling here and there. So uh, one of the things as someone who studies politics or international relations and diplomacy, it's, it's as a student of all these, it's for me, this is more of an iceberg situation where there's far, far more not that in uh, other diplomacy it doesn't work that way, but this in this case, I sense that there is much more that we are not aware of, we're not seeing, than what is actually being said or not said in this case, actions and inactions. Asped, I have a couple of comments about this. First of all, the inaction has put Russia in a very defensive posture in the South Caucasus. So this is a loss and a retreat in their diplomacy and their policy in the Caucasus. And number two, you were mentioning the CSTO, I believe. Pashinyan had approached Putin on a bilateral treaty of 1997 rather than the CSTO charter. I agree. It's it's the bilateral agreement. But then that doesn't mean just because I have an agreement with you to, that you're going to come to my defense. That doesn't give me green light to go ahead and attack and say, well, don't you defend me now? 
that is the basic situation. And still, I'm not sure about your first statement, Aspet, that Russia is on the defensive. As I mentioned, there is a power change, sort of influence change. Let's not call it power change. But I'm not uh, still convinced that Russia is completely unhappy with what it's happen what's happened. I fail to see any future where if, uh, let's say, Armenians are expelled from Artsakh, and if we lose Artsakh, uh, and would have all those refugees from Artsakh in Yerevan, if we're ever going to be, be an ally of Russia, or if Russia will will be able to look at them in the face. And honestly, I mean, maybe that's a little bit too emotional, but if Russia thinks that it could keep Armenia and cede Artsakh to Azerbaijan or let Azerbaijan sort of take Artsakh, I think that many, many analysts would disagree that those two things can happen at the same time. Well, look at the Palestinians. They've been around, they've been refugees for, you know, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. And, uh, you know, no one cares about that. Look at what's happening in Syria and Iraq refugees for the last 10 years. There are so many cases like that. And uh, while I understand the, the sentiment, Hovik, you know, in, in a way... Let, let me rephrase this. Let me rephrase this. It's going to be a hotbed of instability. And it's not like, you know, it's going to be the former Soviet Union again, where all its borders are secure. But there is going to be a constant hotbed of instability. And even Armenians who are displeased with what's going on with, like, you know, people like Sasna Tsarer and all these other like radical groups in Armenia who are not going to be okay with this. So how does Russia think and say, you know, it'll be okay? I think that's what your argument is, right? In a way it is, not completely. I haven't gone into the details again that because I do not have the facts and I can't read Putin's mind. I don't think anyone can. But in the large context of that, you know, one simple solution would be, you know, you bring authoritarianism into the country and you suppress all of those into Armenia. With possible threat there, we're going to withdraw from the bilateral agreement. That's one possibility, one path to follow. Yes, there will be a backlash. But, you know, don't also forget that there are a lot of people who, regardless of what Russia what Russia would do or what Russia's policies would be, they would still be uh, diehard supporters of Russia. So it's not either or. The binary sort of approach doesn't work here. It's beyond binarism here. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, that's the major concern that at least from in my mind is that's the issue. If uh, Artsakh is depopulated, that's it. I don't see any possibility that it would come back, uh, you know, Armenians would be able to, to go back one way or another. The main question is at this point, how do you actually force Azerbaijan to or convince Azerbaijan to go back to the negotiation table with concrete plans, uh, whatever that might be? That would be a whole complete discussion in a different way with the understanding that Armenia's position since 94, 95 has been less and less decreasing in terms of its negotiation. Bargaining power has constantly been decreasing since 1994. Uh, and, uh, sin and now it's actually completely, we're in the negatives. Whatever capital we had, negotiation capital, is gone. I would disagree with us, but that uh, Armenia's position has been decreasing. I mean, in 1994, 1995, Armenia barely had electricity and barely had a functioning economy. Uh, 25 years later, Armenia is actually uh, has an economy that's probably healthier than Azerbaijan's economy. So negotiations, negotiation tactic, Kamil, negotiation capability. Uh, I think there the, the, we need to negotiations occur on the basis of economic uh, opportunity, on the basis of security alliances that are arranged. What has happened today in the last few months? Is a, is a collapse of Armenian deterrence uh, strategy, which I'm not saying that it could not have occurred two years earlier before Pashinyan came to power, but reality is it occurred after he came to power. So that's what the actual sequence of events that we are, we're looking at. Why did Azerbaijan uh, not expand the war in 2016? I mean, it had... So more of a correlation than causation, I'm guessing you're saying. I mean, more of a correlation rather than causation. Uh, it already started. Yeah, I mean, in 2016, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, correlation, uh, causation in, in terms of Pashinyan coming to power and this this uh, war happening, you mean, or what? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's correlation, but correlating event does not occur in independence of each other, right? I mean, there are still influences there. So what I'm observing, what I'm seeing is that the extent of Turkish involvement today uh, in this war came about through a combination of factors. One of the key factors is actually technological factor. They didn't have the, the sort of drone fleet they have today four years ago. So that's that's one objective factor. They didn't have the sort of deployable uh, paramilitary force such as the Syrians that they have today that they had four years ago. Four years ago also was when Erdogan was nearly overthrown. So there were a bunch of other factors there. But uh, again, the reason Turkey did not get involved against Armenia in the early 90s, did not get involved against Armenia since then, because there were a combination of other diplomatic 
deterrence mechanisms, be that Western deterrence, be that Russian deterrence, where Russians warned Turks not to get involved in the early 90s. Even Armenian. Yes. Uh, Armenian deterrence, yeah. Yes, exactly. Armenia under Serge Sarkisyan tried to reach out to Turkey, which Pashinyan had not done at all. Uh, that's another factor that's, uh, you know, there's not been any diplomacy uh, vis-a-vis -vis Turkey in the last two years. None. There are no countries that we've had real diplomatic outreach to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we've had this uh, vacuum of uh, foreign policy thinking. Well, it seems that the vacuum of a strong north-south relationship between Pashinyan and Putin created a pathway for the east-west relationship between Aliyev and Erdogan to rise and for the latter to project power into the South Caucasus. So we had soft power potential that we probably lost. Let's assume that. And I know we're not military experts, but there was this interesting interview on CivilNet by Eric Hakopian, I believe. It was essentially talking about the nuclear option. Do we have anything in terms of that with regard to our military power today? Why isn't, you know, these are like, I'm not saying we should do these, but these are common things that people ask me. So why aren't we hitting the oil pipelines? Why aren't we recognizing Artsakh? Maybe those two things, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, neither one can be a decisive factor. Nuclear option is Russia's involvement. That's the nuclear option. There's not another nuclear option. Yeah, I think, uh, I agree. I mean, I don't think there is any nuclear option in terms of a hidden hand or a hidden weapon. Uh, I don't think at this point the Armenians have any to use. In the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, thinking about the changing climate, you know, with general frost, general mud, general rain was commonly mentioned in Russia as an advantage. But even that would not provide the necessary nuclear option for Armenian side. I don't know to what extent it might be criticized as being demoralizing, but I do not understand to what extent can we make statements that within the next two weeks, we're going to reclaim all the land on by the Armenian side or that things are great. And suddenly we hear that there are diversionary forces by Shushi, the direness of the situation is not being represented for whatever reason. I understand that. But people are thinking that war is, you know, we go and we become heroes. I mean, we are ending up adding so many individuals in the pantheon of martyrs. It's becoming a, a pretty problematic. Going back historically, I think we are seeing the Yerishization of, of the Gharapah War. Yerisha being the uh, fifth century historian priest who actually wrote about the uh, Battle of Abarai and you know, talked about moral victories. and Which also brings another issue. What is victory? What would quantify as victory? I mean, on the Azerbaijani side, it's quantifiable, right? We got land. What would be on the Armenian side? That we prevented them from taking more land? And as long as you have this lack of understanding, what constitutes victory, this war will probably go on for a while. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how our messaging could be different, because I think that a lot of people, even I think our show today will be criticized because we talked about uh, Pashinyan in not that great light. But when you're uh, explaining the results, when you're Artur Novanisyan, how do you explain the results on the battlefield uh, in a way that's more objective and that allows us to win? I mean, sort of, is, isn't, isn't it important to keep the fighting spirit alive? And isn't that what he's doing? That's the thing. I mean, the leadership of Armenia has distanced itself. Pashinyan has distanced himself from the war because he sees that it's not going well. He's trying to, you know, avoid responsibility for what's happening. You have Arturo Novanisyan covering for him. But uh, I mean, Arturo Novanisyan is just a spokesman for the defense ministry. He's not even, uh, cannot be <laughs> seen as like the central voice of Armenia. Uh, the situation is very, very dire. You could see that uh, recognized by leadership of Nagorno-Karabakh, by the way, Araik Arutunyan, early on. I mean, he's been much more outspoken in terms of uh, recognizing that the military situation is dire. And you have not seen that uh, from Nikol Pashinyan's side. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think he's really commented on the military situation since October 7, uh, when he went to Karabakh. It was the only time it was reported that he went over this period of time and claimed that now we're going to have the counteroffensive and everything's going to be great. And then since then, that counteroffensive failed. Basically been talking in general terms about uh, Azerbaijan doing nefarious things, but Turkey doing nefarious things or Israel doing nefarious things. But, you know, it's, again, um, no leadership. No leadership in Armenia. That's the biggest problem I see right now. Emil, how come the defense minister has been so quiet? Don Oyan. The speculation I heard is that he was told to be quiet by uh, Nikol Pashinyan because uh, there was suspicions whether Don Oyan might have been a more acceptable 
palatable replacement for Pashinyan, even for his political party, right? His party in, in parliament. So I think there was some kind of tension there. But Tonoyan obviously has been a failure as well in terms of his ability to project uh, leadership in the situation. Seran Ohanyan, who is under criminal charges, is in charge of defense of Shushi right now. <laughs> that just tells me the collapse of decision making at the military level as well. That's amazing. Seran Ohanyan has been out of the military for the last uh, 15 years. So he is in charge of defense of Shushi. One thing I want to add about the, the situation as being dire, uh, we've been focusing on the Armenian side, obviously, because we have more information and more material to analyze that the situation might not be that easy on the Azerbaijani side. As much as they have had military success on the ground, overall, when it comes to uh, the internal issues and the justification, and I think Aliyev is also as motivated to put an end to this one way or another and declare victory, even though he would have more things to show for his victory. I think there is an, a sense of urgency in Baku as well to uh, to end this. And I wouldn't put past the Turkish government to keep pushing them. And I think the constant visits by the Turkish defense and foreign ministers to Baku might be to keep pushing them. I think Aliyev has definitely achieved much more than he expected from the beginning. It's clear from his commentary uh, how it changed over time. He is in a very happy place right now. You know, uh, he's guaranteed his family rule for I don't know how much longer. With Turkish presence on the ground, Turkish military's ability to raise their level of their involvement and keep, uh, you know, replenishing it. He's got almost unlimited resources. Yes, his armies suffered major casualties. Aliyev's army suffered major casualties, no doubt about it. But I'm not sure if it makes a big difference right now because Armenia is not taking initiative and is not uh, looking for uh, Aliyev's uh, weak spot and and, uh, and lets Aliyev dictate the terms of engagements. Turkey comes in, keeps sending mercenaries and keeps re increasing uh, its drone fleet involvement when they have to and uh, pulling it back and taking a break when they don't have to. So uh, because he's got Turkish direct involvement and Armenia doesn't have Russian direct involvement, it's, it's a very unequal fight. Let's see what happens. I appreciate your time and talk to you next week. All right. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you, Ovi. Thank you. That concludes our program for this episode of Groom Weekend Review. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues from this previous week. We look forward to your feedback and suggestions for issues to cover in greater depth. Contact us on our website at groom.org, that's G-R-O-O-N-G, and on our Facebook page, ann groom or in our Facebook group, groom armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. I'm Hovik Manacharyan, and on behalf of everyone in this episode, I wish you a good week. Thank you for listening, and talk to you next week.